Welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most tantalizing topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 142nd edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 535th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, October 10th, 2019. I am your host, Jared Morris. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call, how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Smart takes the shot. The Hoosiers have won the national championship. For this week's Banner Moment, we have to go back to Saturday's Hoosier Hysteria. And it occurred midway through the event after the introductions were complete and after Calvert Chaney had treated the DJ like Dwayne Morton and demanding some intro music that he could dance to. That's when Indiana sent out a release saying that Rob Finnessy, Devontae Green, and Deron Davis would all be held out of the rest of the event as a precaution. Now, obviously having three guys held out of the fun and games of Hoosier hysteria after only one week of practice isn't a positive, especially when it's three guys whose various absences last year cost Indiana an NCAA tournament bid. But what immediately struck me about the release was whose name was not on it. Jerome Hunter. Given all of the uncertainty surrounding Jerome's health this offseason, I don't think anyone would have been surprised to see him held out of Hoosier hysteria as a precaution. Unfortunately, we've all had to learn to temper our expectations when it comes to Jerome's availability. Which is why seeing Jerome truly have the green light to participate in all activities was so encouraging. And to be fair, this has been Archie's stance on it for more than a month now. This was just the first public evidence backing up all the public pronouncements. Now, it's worth noting that this doesn't mean that Jerome is out of the woods yet with his mysterious leg condition. He acknowledged in his post-event remarks that it's still a day-by-day thing. But regardless, Saturday represented an important stepping stone toward him becoming a regular part of the IU rotation who can be counted on for consistent minutes in production. And sure, Jerome's performance in the scrimmage was encouraging too. The beautiful turnaround fadeaway jumper that he kissed off the glass and his great assist to Joey Brunk were two of the biggest highlights of the short scrimmage. It was a reminder of the versatile skill set he possesses that, if available last season, might have swung at least one or two losses into the win column. But production in a scrimmage in which two of the three experienced guards don't play is really beside the point. What really mattered is simply that Jerome played at all, and that he looked healthy and comfortable doing so. After the event, while answering questions from media members, Jerome said, quote, I'm happy to be back out there. Joy spread across his face as he said it. It was a reminder of what he's had to go through over the past year, and a reminder that as happy as we all are to see him back on the court, it surely pales in comparison to how happy he must feel to just be able to be back out there playing again. Quote, I love the fans here, he said. The feeling is mutual. And if Hoosier hysteria was a sign that Jerome is truly ready to be a full-time player for Indiana, it means Archie Miller will have the versatile wing score with a reliable jump shot that this team's projected rotation so desperately needs. All right, now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. Coach is off this week, but he's dropping knowledge with the chat mob, as always. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. That's right. Coach is all of our teacher. To my left, he is the Dave Roberts of Girls Youth Sports Coaching in Cincinnati, the president emeritus of the Robert Johnson Fan Club, and one of the world's most renowned and occasionally angry bracketologists. Oh, crap. No, stop doing that. Hey, you shut up. Yes, in addition to being comfortable, the sweatshirt is a great thing that you can use to cover your mouth and scream obscenities into while you're watching a game like this. It's time to shut (laughs) the down, folks. He is Andy Bottoms. Andy, what is your Bottoms line on the last week in Indiana basketball? I would have been really impressed if you could have turned around what I said before the show when I arrived and get it in there that quickly. But alas, you were unable to it's coming, unable folks. to do it. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Uh, I, it's hard to go a, a different direction than what you did, really. Uh, it's, you know, as you guys said, after Hoosier Hysteria, uh, in a bold move for Ryan to say, basically, at the beginning of the show, I thought this whole thing was a waste of time. But gather around and listen to us talk about it for 45 minutes. It was, it yeah. was a waste of time. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, you really can't. It, it's hard to take a lot away. As you said, the guys that weren't there um, made it difficult. And just the, the general atmosphere and, and everything else uh, was a little bit tough to get a read on. So all you can really go back to is being able to see a guy like Jerome, who everybody has, you know, all the rumors and speculation of 
what he what he is, what he could be. Is he going to be back? Is he not going to be back? Um, you know, just to see him out there, and you could see glimpses of, of what that's going to be. And I, I think it's another chance to kind of remind everybody, like it's a going to be a slow process for him. It's easy to get excited about some of the things that he did, um, but I also think it's been you know a year plus since he's really p- played in a competitive game situation. You don't really know what his conditioning um you know certainly they've been doing things off the court but but to what extent that you know gets him ready for uh you know game action i I think again if you're you're careful with him and work yourself into a a place where around the middle of the season around the the start of big 10 play that maybe he's really you know finally starting to hit his stride i think that would be a positive but uh you know regardless it was it was great to see him out there again you could see some of the things that you you know everybody you know, wants to see him do on the floor and the kinds of skills and uh and things that this team is going to need uh to to be you know to kind of outperform the the preseason expectations that everybody's talked to death at this point so uh you know exciting to see him there otherwise don't know that you you take a whole lot away but uh at least uh, a good thing to see him out there and have some pseudo real action to talk about and to my right, he is a senior writer at the Big Lead, the world's number one unemployed shot doctor, and he is sadly currently suffering from a debilitating ankle injury that he suffered earlier this week while being chased through Waterfront Park in San Diego by one of Dean Spanos's revenge thirsty henchmen. Fortunately, Ryan avoided capture, but he could not escape injury. Friends, please join me as we bow our heads in a moment of sympathy for Ryan's ankle, which is currently swollen to about 15 times its normal size and somehow probably impacts his ability to check Gmail. I should have never told you that. Ryan, if you can manage it through the pain, what is your rant this week? Don't make fun of my pain, man. It sucks. <laughs> Would you like the background music while you rant? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can shut it off. It's fine. Uh, no, and when I told you I hadn't checked Gmail yet, it's because I was at the doctor getting x-rays on it uh, because it was so bad. But yes, I am surviving over here. Uh, Year nine, when we go to Gmail humor. I know is, my, my girlfriend came home today and she's I showed her the ankle. She's like, yeah, whatever. And I was walking around there. She's like, babe, what is wrong with your ankle? I didn't see the bruising. And there's just a huge bruise everywhere. She said in the light, she hadn't seen how bad it was. So thanks for the sympathy. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, uh, no, I, I think that where I'm at right now, I mean, not a lot has happened since we talked to you guys last uh, after Hoosier hysteria. I, I just think that it, finally we're at a point where all the offseason stuff is done. It, this is I, Mark Hoosier hysteria is like the last, like the demarcation line of the off season. Even Hoosier hysteria feels like an off season event, kind of. And then it's like the next day they get to actual work. And so uh, I feel like if finally, after you know, we've waited a long time for basketball, and um, we had you know, kind of a quiet off season, really. And and um, so I, I'm just ready to start, you know getting to talk about actual games and I'm, I'm ready. Bring on Gannon. Just bring on Gannon. I, that's what I, I'm ready for it. Um, but I think it's, it's nice to finally have them be actually practicing and, and have actual stuff uh, to, to talk about. All right. Well, here's, what we're going to talk about this week. We will run through a few Hoosier headlines, but then we're going to spend some time discussing really the single most important player on this year's roster. And finally, we're going to answer your questions. A lot of good ones. So we're going to save some extra time for questions today. All of that coming this week on Assembly Call Radio. Before we get to all that, though, I do want to talk about tickets real quick. You know, you have a lot of options when it comes to where you get your sports tickets. And this isn't an industry that is known for its growth, innovation and customer friendliness. But with millions of live event tickets and a price match guarantee, SeatGeek proves that there's a better way. They built the fastest way to find tickets so that you can stop searching for the perfect seat and instead start enjoying it. Just look at the App Store. SeatGeek has over 50,000 five-star reviews, and the reason is because they deliver a better process for buying tickets. SeatGeek pulls together millions of tickets from all over the web, and then they rate each deal on a scale of 1 to 10 with a color-coded system to show the value. Green dots mean good deals, red dots are overpriced. Then they display the tickets on an interactive seat map so you can see right where they are. And every purchase is fully guaranteed so you can shop for tickets with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone because it's by far the easiest and fastest way to find tickets. Going to get concert tickets on there. Actually, already got concert tickets on there. And I just looked and people have used the assembly call code to buy IU Florida State tickets. I saw someone bought St. Louis Cardinals tickets. There was a concert of someone whose name I don't know because they're probably a current pop star. 
So you can pretty much get everything there on SeatGeek, which is why it's a good place to stop for your tickets. Get a brother, get some coupons. Yes, you can. SeatGeek will give you $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. All you need to do is use our promo code. So download the SeatGeek app today and use the promo code ASSEMBLY for $10 off your first purchase. That's promo code ASSEMBLY for $10 off your first purchase. All right, gentlemen. Well, I want to uh, begin uh, this show by honoring uh, a listener of the week. Uh, And this honor goes out, as it did last year, to Valerie, uh, who was at Hoosier Hysteria and inspired by my proclamation of being president of the Devontae Green Fan Club, got the Lindy Sports cover autographed by Devontae Green, which you can see right there. Nice. Just like she did last year with the Jawan Morgan one. And uh, Valerie also sending posters uh, my way. So Valerie... Huge, uh, just you know, she's always looking out for us. Valerie's incredible. I hope she's listening tonight. Uh, we really, you know, we we appreciate everything that you do for the show. So I wanted to give her also a shows that Jared's out. affection can be bought. Let's <laughs> let's not be I mean, let's not beat around the bush. <laughs> We've always known that was true, Andy. You and I know that's true. Uh, okay, guys. So you know, Ryan, you pretty much said it. I mean, nothing has happened really since Hoosier hysteria. Not a lot of news. Uh, Jeff Rabjohns reported that Dawson Garcia will take his IU official visit uh, October 25th through the 27th. So that's obviously big news. Um, you know, that that's kind of the next big official. Christian Lander was there for Hoosier hysteria. Trey Kaufman Did we get the was list as of- well. The yeah, who else was it? Trey Kaufman was there, and Kaufman, then, Lander, you know, Galloway and Leo yeah, on their official visits right. and stuff. Caleb First was there, uh, and I think some younger recruits were there as well. Gotcha. And there, there may. Have I been wasn't sure others. we got a definitive list. Last I heard, we hadn't. So. Yeah, um, and then you know, I was interested to see that Romeo Langford uh, cleared to practice. He's been working on his jump shot. Ryan uh, seems like he's kind of quickened the release on it a little bit. Uh, he only measured at six four, so a little bit shorter than what he was listed at in Indiana. I would have thought six um, five. Yeah, the NBA is like getting real serious about like I know. you know making sure guys are the the right height. Uh, Steve Green and Brian Sloan both signed the alumni wall, and then you know I was kind of wondering where are the off season videos, and then I forgot that Alex Sherrill, who did those videos, moved on, took a job with the Knicks. So it seems like Indiana has not filled that position. So if you're and wondering why there haven't been as many videos this off season, that is probably a reason why. And it'd be and nice to get know, some of those. Yeah, we know that Archie is someone who wants that kind of stuff. He wanted to modernize the social media and all that. So uh, I'm surprised they haven't filled that position. I think coach's yeah. feedback on the, on the videos last year carried, carried some weight. And I don't want to see about vertical leaps anymore. <laughs> well, you know, it took Archie a long time to fill the third assistant position. So maybe he's just very deliberate and wants to get the right guy instead of rushing into it. You know, that's what there we'll, you. that's what we'll go with. So Andy, any he- headlines for you? I mean, it's, you know, I think we're all we're all kind of at the same point as Ryan said. It, Hoosier hysteria happened. Let's get to Gannon. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think the uh, yeah the Garcia yeah the Garcia news from a recruiting standpoint uh, is certainly uh, important. Although I I would imagine there there seemed to be kind of a weird flurry of of guys um, making commitments uh, earlier than normal. But I I would tend to think that his will probably you know last into the spring. So I'm not sure that there be anything imminent. But um, but, maybe you know, if they wow him in Bloomington. He'll he'll come maybe back. maybe. Um, and no, other than that, I mean, in terms of you had in the rundown, any other lingering thoughts from Hoosier hysteria? And I thought the other guy that stood out in the at least the parts that I was able to to catch was Al. Um, and I don't think that's terribly surprising in that setting. A guy who's you know established himself as a leader and and shown the ability to continue to grow over the course of his career. So I don't know that that should be surprising to anybody. Um, but I thought him and and Trace had some you know, showed some good things and that, that let you kind of spin forward in your mind what he uh, is going to be as he, you know, gets used to the competition level and all those kinds of things. So, yeah, um, Trace's uh, movement looked really good, just even like on his dunking and, and things like that. He looked quicker. He looked, you know, I, I, I don't want to say he ever looked heavy, but he looked kind of bulky when he was making his movements in high school. He looks real fluid. And, and I think that, 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 you know, the weight program has really helped him so far. Cliff Marshall. I mean, he... He looks like an NBA athlete out there. You know, yeah, now, and, he's got to add the skill to it. But I mean, just the way he looks, he is he is an impressive athlete. And I, you know, I always thought he looked like a really talented player who had some athleticism. But he, the way he was moving, like running up and down the floor and things like that, you can just tell some guys. Sometimes guys just loosen up, and and yeah. it feels like he's a lot more flexible, a lot more loose. And then you know, you see his arm and leg movements, and he just looks like a guy who's you know unlocking some extra athleticism there. 
Yep. All right. Well, let's move on because we've got a lot to talk about with Rob and then we want to get to some of these questions. So let's keep it rolling. Coming up, we are going to talk about the guy whose growth and development is essential if Indiana is going to beat its preseason expectations. That is Rob Finnessy. Where does he rank among Big Ten point guards and what do we expect from him this season? Stick with us. We're going to discuss that next on the Assembly Call. This is Verdell Jones. What's better than an epic buzzer beater, a full court dribble, and a perfectly placed pass to set it all up? And of course, celebrating with Hoosier Nation afterwards. So join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the assembly call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosier! Thank you, Verdell. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. You can find all of our content at our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to join the chat mob during our unedited live broadcast, or if you want to watch those replays and see all the between segment banner, uh, then check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assembly call. I'm Jared Morse. I'm, yes? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I got to say something about Verdell in that intro, Jared. Is he one? He's one of those few guys who is way more beloved after his career than during his career. Have you noticed that as well? Yes. Like people it, always bring him up as like a man. I loved Riddell Jones. It's like and he it's because the, the brunt of three years of frustration was taken out on him, and unfairly. that wasn't fair, obviously. right? And then people actually realized, oh wait, that was you know kind of unfair how we treated Riddell, and you know, and I think the way, unfortunately, the way that his career ended. You know, I think gave him a little bit of sympathy at the very end, but yeah. I, but I think for the most part, the positive feelings people have about him is because you know what that guy was put in a tough spot. It was actually a pretty good player. But- well, and it's funny, Bill, because like I hear him his cameo, and I'm like, that makes me happy. Like Karen from yeah. Verdell. Like I, I don't know. I, I just I, I think that it's weird how sometimes those guys go so underappreciated when they're on campus, and then. And he, you know, and he was part of the resurgent team in 2012, and was part of that big yeah. moment. You know, so that really helped. And he would have won the Big Ten tournament if he hadn't gotten hurt, dead gummit. Yeah. Anyway. He's, he's got to come back sign the alumni wall. Yeah, he does. Yes, he does. Okay, gentlemen, speaking of point guards who played a lot as freshmen, uh, let's talk about Rob Finnessy. Because, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about Jerome Hunter and talking about Devontae Green and Al Durham and, you know, Trace Jackson Davis. It feels like it's been a while since we've brought the conversation back to Rob Finnessy. And I think it's important that we do that because – it's easy to get caught up with all of these other guys, and they're all important. We all know that. But there is no path to Indiana exceeding preseason expectations that does not include Rob taking a giant step forward. And I'm not talking about just from his overall numbers for last season, because as we're going to get into, those, you know, they're not that impressive. And they were depressed by, you know, the injury that he had that really affected him during the middle of the season. But he's got to take a step forward and build on the you know the inflated numbers that he had when you removed the concussion from the equation because those numbers you know four or five assists per game uh, you know shooting forty percent from three point range I mean he was really coming along you know really even better than you could expect from a freshman point guard and when we talk about you know this Indiana team possibly you know finishing in the top half of the Big Ten making the NCAA tournament. You know, this is a guy that we think is going to be the workhorse. I think we all agree he'll probably play the most minutes on the team, either he or Devontae Green. And I think it's fair to say, Andy, that he's going to be the catalyst for this team on offense, you know, as the point guard. He's not going to be the leading scorer. He's not the spark plug like Devontae Green, but he's the catalyst. And certainly defensively, with the way that he plays on the ball, how smart he is, and how important that position is for the kind of defense Archie wants to play – you know, he's going to spearhead the defense. And if he can do it like he did in the Marquette game, in the in the Michigan State game, and some of his finer moments, you know, that's a path for Indiana to have a top 20 defense. So, you know, any way you look at it, he is absolutely essential for this team getting to where we all think that they can be. Well, I think, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to look at that. I think defensively, you, know, you touched on the watching him play against Cassius Winston toward the end of the Michigan State game uh, as we were there last year was, you know, kind of, peak defensive uh defensive version of rob i would say and so if he can be able to do that over really at the at the point of attack um that can be incredibly disruptive and then on the flip side of that i I think it's uh, you look at the general you know lack of depth or lack of another true point guard behind him i think that puts you know increased burden on him to really be able to to run the show and uh, and be able to get guys where they need to be. Archie's talked a lot more about you know better ball movement and player movement this year. So 
I, I think that puts more onus on the point guard than the system that was being run last year that was so, you know, ball screen heavy and things like that. Now, whether that re- actually happens remains to be seen, but at least in what, you know, Archie's comments uh, have been that there'll be a, you know, different look to the offense in that regard, which I think will be uh, a welcome different look to many. Um, but that does put more on Rob's plate and be able to get guys into sets and in the right spots and uh, all those kinds of things. But I, I think he can handle it. And I, it, it's hard to, to really, it is a little bit hard to assess him over the, the course of his freshman season because there's a normal uh, or at least expected freshman trajectory that you, you might expect from a guy and where he started was I think higher than what people thought. And so everybody projected that forward and said, hey, here's the trajectory he's going to be on. Well, you know, the middle of the season just kind of dropped off, dropped off the table and almost started over in some ways. And I think was, so he, he missed out on some of those opportunities to really grow in that scenario. Everything was so disrupted by the, um, by the concussion. And you had this stretch of games. I was looking through his game log where everything is just terrible. And then all of a sudden you see it finally starts to come back. So, um, you know, hopefully there's at least been that trajectory and progression from where he was at the end of the season through the off season. But, uh, I, I agree. I agree with you. He's, um, maybe more just from a having another guy with his skill set, the the least replaceable guy. I guess if you if you think of it that way, at least there's nobody else on the roster who could clearly step in and, and take that spot. And you know, Ryan, the thing that I think is interesting when you look at he and Devonte is, and, and obviously there are question marks about the backcourt, but I think offensively, there's a chance those guys can fit really well together. You know, because Devonte is the scorer. You know, he's a guy who's going to be risky. He's going to, you know, make some plays and he's obviously going to, you know, make some plays that aren't that good. Rob is much steadier and can kind of help balance it out, help smooth things out. And I think those two being able to play off of each other really, you know, may take a little while to kind of get that chemistry going. But I really think that could be something that's that's a potent one two combo in the backcourt for Indiana. Yeah, I agree. I think that their games really match up well. I think that that as far as scoring, I think that Devontae's better off the ball, um, being set up and then being able to get, you know, and being able to run off screens or something like that, then get the ball and be able to work as opposed to just bringing it up and trying to to create something. And I think that that Rob became, you know, at times looked like a pretty good catch and shoot guy last year off of reversals and and things like that. So, you know, if you've got him bringing the ball up and you've got Devonte playing off of him. I think that's the ideal situation for Indiana. I do think those two guys can play off of each other. And I think they could both play defense uh, together on the perimeter. And then you throw in another guy like Al and it's sort of a different weapon as well. So I, I think that you, they do match up well together, not just offensively, but sort of the whole package of what they can each bring to the table. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that that's a good set up for Indiana. We'll see how it actually plays out, but I think that that's, that's a, a pairing that will work well in the backcourt. Yeah. And you know, Rob also is a guy who seemed to get more comfortable penetrating and driving to the basket as the season went on. He's very good at feeding the post, which is going to be important for the way that Indiana wants to play with probably a really good back to the basket postman in at all times. And he's very good catch and shoot, you know, from passes out of the post, which we saw a number of times. And all of those are going to be useful skills for the way that Indiana wants to play. And, you know, Archie also wants to play up tempo and Rob is going to be the guy who's, you know, he, he is much more comfortable leading a break than Al is, and he's much smarter with his decision making than Devonte is. I often think Devonte is better as a trailer or doing something off a pass rather than leading the break. And so, I agree. You know, for all of those reasons, you know, Andy, as you said, I mean, he's got really an irreplaceable offensive skill set for Indiana, and you know, that's why to me, he's probably going to get as many minutes as he can handle. And and so, you know, it's going to be a big burden on him uh, on the offensive and defensive end. But you know, Andy, I, I looked at. Bart Torvik's projections, um, you know, not to say that they're the best or anything, but he's got his preseason projections out and he's pretty low on Indiana. And one of the reasons why I think he's low on Indiana is to me, you know, his projections for Rob, they do not match with what I'm expecting. You know, his projections are 7.2 points per game, 2.7 assists, 2.9 rebounds, playing 64% of minutes with an 18% usage rate. And just to give you some context, full season numbers last year, Rob averaged 6.8 points, uh, 2.9 assists, 3.3 rebounds, played 61% of minutes, usage rate was 16.9%. You know, when I look at those, Andy, I mean, to me, Rob's going to play 80 plus percent of the minutes, you know, be a 10 plus point scorer. You know, and should average, you know, north of four assists per game if you just look at what he was doing last year outside of the games, you know, sandwiched in the middle with all those concussions. 
And so, you know, if you start to put those projections up to what I think we all think would be a more reasonable rate, now, you know, you're bumping Indiana up a little bit more. And so I think, again, as you look for, okay, what are some reasons why Indiana can outperform these expectations? I, I just, I don't think people who didn't see all the games and don't have the full context understand how much the concussion affected him and depressed his numbers. And, I, you know, so I think he's going to surprise some people with how well he plays. Yeah, and I, that's one of those where I'm and I'm not smart enough to know how, you know, stuff like that would factor into to Bart's model because there are there is game data to take in from the time when he was kind of working his way back. And I mean, if you look at the the game log on Ken Palm, it's like brutal for you know, a long stretch in the middle of the season. Yeah. But if you look at the last 8 games, um where he really, you know, you could see a little bit of progression. So starting with that Wisconsin game, you know, he had an offensive rating of 100 or more in six of those eight after, you know, rarely doing that over the you know prior eight games. He had at least four assists in seven of those eight games. I only I you only lost once. That was a Wichita State game when he had four or more assists. Um, and so the scoring wasn't always big. And that's, you know, maybe the only pushback that I would would give to you. And I think it's kind of a question of trying to figure out, you know, what's an optimal mix for him in terms of like, you know, points per game average versus assists. I think if he's in the, you know, five assist range, then maybe scoring eight points a game as opposed to, you know, being a double figure guy or something like that is perfectly acceptable. And maybe what's yeah, better he's for a real, he's for a real point guard. Yeah. It's, yeah. So well, I think that's, but, a, but he showed I, in I think high that's school. a hard one is figuring out how to strike that balance, but go ahead. What well, no, I was going to say, I mean, he showed in high school that he's, He's good at understanding when he needs to push it and score and when not to. And some of that may be determined, okay, you know, is Jerome Hunter ready to play 20 minutes, 25 minutes and assume a scoring role? You know, do are, are Brunk and Deron Davis, you know, healthy and consistent down low? You know, if, if, if Indiana can win with Rob scoring four points a game, he'll probably do it. I don't think that's going to be the recipe for victory. I think he'll have to score between, you know, probably nine or 11. And there may be some games when other guys are struggling, you know, and they're sagging down low that he's going to have to step up and knock down some shots and score 15 Boy. or 16. But he has shown throughout his basketball career, that ability to adapt. And he even did it some last year, too. Well, and let's remember that last year in the backcourt, you had Romeo Langford kind of sucking up all the oxygen. Not not as a negative to Romeo. He had to do that. But I think that he deferred a lot to Romeo. And as he gets older and more mature, I don't think he's going to do that as much. He doesn't need to do that as much. Now, you're right. It's going to depend on who he's who he's in the lineup with. Is Jerome Hunter out there to... to to score off the wing. So remember, Rob can get to the hoop. He got to the hoop a lot last year, whether it was to pass or just to sort of run through the the, the defense and find a find an opening. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how his game evolves from one year to the next. Best thing about freshmen is they become sophomores. That this is, um, you know, going to have to be something where he is going to have to take a step forward. I agree. I don't think that he's got to score. 10 to 12 points a game for Indiana to be great. I think he's got to be able to take his shots and hit them when he gets them. He's got to be able to knock down threes. He's got to be able to, you know, if the floor is spread, he's got to be able to cut through and get to the hoop and either give it up or uh, score it. I, I think it's it's more what kind of player he has to be than the numbers to me to yeah. be a really effective guy because Devante can be the guard that scores more. Um, we've seen and, that. and some of it may depend on how ready Al is to be a consistent scorer. Because Al is For a guy sure. last year that you know would have you know ten points, twelve points, thirteen points, nothing, you know, and would just you know throw a zero up there. You know, Al is going to have to be more consistent. And if he's ready to be that guy, then you know that reduces some of that scoring pressure on Rob too. What I do think, you know, Ryan, to your point, he's got to be able to step up and make shots to keep defenses honest to allow his penetration game to work. And he's got to become more efficient around the basket. His two point field goal percentage last year was, you know, 37.5%, something like that. Yeah. Obviously he's a small it was guy really bad at one stretch in this. It season. was, but he's, you know, he's got to get better at that. And he's got to knock down free throws when he gets there. Cause he wasn't a particularly good free throw yep. shooter last year. So those are some of the things to work on. Let's, let's just say this right now. Everybody, Everybody. <laughs> down free throws when they get yes. there. This is true. Yeah. That, uh, that is one thing that I was struck by and looking back at the numbers is just how low his shooting percentages were. Even, three point percentages um which, which took a pretty pretty big dip after the beginning of the season i mean he ended up 31 percent from three as you 40 pre concussion uh, oh yeah under 40 percent uh on twos and those are you know not a not a not a a meaningless number of attempts you know 129 twos he made 51 87 threes he made 27 um so you know those numbers have to get better to be able to allow him to to be a threat um 
and and to Ryan's point, maybe he'll finish around the basket when he does drive. Uh, you know, that's something that that has to get better. I think if you look at the the positives, even while struggling uh, in conference play, his turnover rate was under twelve percent, which is a really good foundation for a freshman really yeah. stepping into some difficult situations. So, if you want to look at the glass half full approach, you would look at that and and you know his numbers down the stretch and um, feel like you've got a pretty good guy that's going to improve upon an assist rate last year that was that was decent but it has has some room to grow and already has a low turnover rate which is something that you would not expect from a, a freshman point guard at all so well, and if you look at his season it's weird he kind of hit the freshman wall really late in the year because he was fine had the concussion and then once he got back and was playing more he was okay, but he really, it seemed like he tired out at the end of the year. If you look at the numbers, I mean, I don't think we felt that at the time, but it seemed like from the Rutgers game through the postseason, he really, you know, offensively, his numbers yeah. were not great. And Here's a little up now, like the Ohio State game. He was basically non existent. Yeah, game. exactly. Uh, what game was it that he got the concussion in? Was it Central Jacksonville? Arkansas? Or whatever that last. No, it was, game. it was Central. It was Central. Central, Central. The game that he played seven minutes. Yeah, because he only played seven minutes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, and that's where he had really like started to build some momentum. some good momentum at that point. I mean, he had scored twelve, ten, and nine points in the in the three games prior. Uh, I had the big shot against Butler too. To that, mm-hmm. and yeah, that was right after the Butler game. So yeah, you can you definitely at- see where that trajectory that I talked about just really got thrown off course pretty quickly in that in that scenario. And it's crazy because if you look at where Indiana was, they beat Northwestern, beat one at Penn State, beat Louisville beat Butler, beat Central Arkansas, and then it just fell off a cliff because Rob got hurt. I, and I don't know if the two are necessarily – It's there's not necessarily a direct link there, but you lost an emerging contributor. Sure felt like it in the moment. <laughs> yeah, it, it did. And you lost an emerging contributor that like maybe could have made up for some of the deficiencies from other people. It wasn't just like you lost this guy and that production was taken away. You lost a guy who was improving – yeah. while other guys were dropping off. And so, you know, and there's ebbs and flows like that in the season. And that's why injuries are so devastating because it's not necessarily that this guy is one-to-one with this guy, but, you know, there's those up and down, you know, times during a season where uh, a player who might be in could take up some of that slack. So, Andy, uh, that, that was kind of interesting to look at where Rob might fit in the hierarchy of Big Ten point guards right now. And when you project it forward, you know, where he's going to be as a junior and a senior. You, know, you look at it right now, Cassius Winston, obviously in a class of his own, and there are two other senior point guards, Anthony Cowan and Xavier Simpson. You'd certainly rate those guys ahead of Rob right now just for their production, their experience. Then you've got a group of juniors, Nogel Eastern, Trent Frazier, Demetric Trice, all guys who have been really productive. And that if you were just looking at it for a one season scenario, you might I think, prefer I think really productive Rob. is a bit generous for a couple of those guys, but well, they, they've been productive. They, they've, you know, they've been, they've been productive players. Um, they all, but they all have holes in their game. Certainly like been on the those, court. Yeah. None of those, none of those guys are perfect, but they've been, they've been productive. And then, you know, after that, you've got whatever Ohio State's point guard situation is going to be, you know, does, does DJ Carton take that over? Is it Walker, somebody else? And then you start looking down, Jamari Wheeler, Geo Baker, you know, uh, McCaffrey's probably going to be playing point guard while Bohannon's out, Marcus Carr, Cam Mack, AJ Turner. Like, I think you would probably take Rob over those guys. So it, it seems to me right now, like he kind of slides in there right in the middle. And then if he has the kind of growth that we think he might, you know, maybe he is better than Demetric Trice or a Trent Frazier or a Nojel Easter. I don't think he's going to crack the top three this year, but I think he's got a chance to get into that maybe second tier. And if he does, that's the path to Indiana, you know, being maybe fourth, fifth, sixth in the conference. But what's nice is when you look beyond that, you know, once Winston Cowan and Simpson graduate next year, you know, Rob, you know, slides in that those other guys aren't clearly going to be better than him. And certainly when they're gone, you know, he kind of projects to be one of the only senior point guards in his class, which is a real reason for optimism over the next couple of years. If he stays on kind of the growth trajectory that we expect, because, you know, as we see in the big 10, you know, a lot of times you go as your, as your point guards go, as your guards go. And so that's a, I think that's a good sign for Indiana. Where that's would you all, slot him right that's, now? That's though? all the basketball right now is go as your yeah. point guard these days. Yeah. Where would you slot him in, Andy? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, he certainly isn't where those those seniors are, but I do think, um, you know, the guys that that you talked about, you know, Eastern is is known more for his defense than his 
uh, than his offense, given you know some of his shooting struggles. Frazier is the guy that you put in that group that's been that to me was has been the most productive. Now everybody's got questions about Illinois, and, and who knows what that will be. And then you know Trice has had some injury issues. What does he uh, look like without Hap? And uh, that's really a question about Wisconsin in general. But um, yeah, you get you get past that. I think you know DJ Carton's an interesting one as you um, look at Ohio State, but I. You know they've got some other options there where they may share some of those duties. So I think he right around the you know middle of the pack, and you know to your point where you'd expect him to be, and uh, it, it just is like I said, looking through his game log is is something. You, there's like an 11 game stretch where his offensive rating was under 100, like eight of those 11, and that not so surprisingly coincided with the you know the the downfall of IU season. And um, so I think you could already see like when. And they were getting steady play from him. And it wasn't necessarily games where he was scoring a lot of points. The team was dramatically more effective. And I don't, you know, and really when you look back at last year's team, it's not all that different in the sense that he was really, if you wanted a true point guard, he was the guy that had to work out. And when he didn't work out last year, whether that was because of health or poor play or whatever the case was, the team really struggled. And in that regard, things aren't really different this year other than the fact that uh, Devontae has a more defined role that does not involve um, being one of the, you know, primary ball handling options, which I think is, you know, as we've discussed is, is best for probably everybody involved. Um, And so I, I just really underscores how important he is and, and underscores the fact that if he can't, you know, really continue that growth and provide the things that everybody wants him to do, um, that things really, you know, could, could go awry. And that could really be the reason that IU ends up where people are projecting them. And by the same token, if he's able to, uh, you know, play well and do some things more consistently that he was able to do a season ago, why they could exceed those expectations, because it's really, I I think whether it's Torvik or anybody else is going to have a hard time projecting what he's going to be because you've got a lot of noise in the, in the data that he, you know, provided on the stat sheet over the course of uh, his freshman season. Hey guys, um, as Andy's talking, I'm looking through last season's scores. I think I want to go jump off a bridge. And like, <laughs> Not recommended. Don't, don't don't do that to yourself. At Maryland, lose by three. Uh, Rutgers lose by t- at Rutgers lose by ten when he should have won it. Uh, Make no excuses. At home against Iowa, lost by five. Why are, why are you doing this? At like, home I mean, just Iowa talking. Okay, that's it. No, no, we're going to break. We're, we're going to break. Why are we allowing this? All right, coming up in our so third bad. segment, we will we so answer bad. your questions, including what we think of Purdue's decision to ban students and faculty from placing bets on Purdue, uh, which hip hop artists we'd invite to Hoosier Stereo. A question about minutes, one about recruiting. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. Zeisloft, I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. Welcome back to The Assembly Call. I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips and Andy Bottoms. Remember that you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter. We send out a weekly IU News Roundup, even during the offseason. And then after every game, once the season starts, we send out a detailed post-game analysis the morning after. It's the only way that you can get that post-game analysis is on our email. There's over 6,700 people on it right now. So text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. That's IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. Time for our mailbag now, guys. All these questions submitted in our private IU basketball discussion community, which you can learn more about at assemblycall.com slash community. We had like five people join this week. So that thing is really, really picking up some steam, gaining some members uh, as we head toward the season. All these questions from them. Uh, so let's start with this one from coach, because when coach submits a question, we go to that one first, uh, Purdue just banned faculty and students from betting on Purdue athletics. Now that sports wagering is legal in Indiana. Is this a good move? And should Indiana university consider a similar proposal? It's certainly a good move if they want to save money because you know, when has betting on Purdue sports really yeah, ever we would never, for you we would never long-term. advise anyone to do that under any circumstances, regardless of your profession status as an athlete doesn't matter. Remember how hyped they were coming into the uh, year for football? How's that going? That was that was really just too easy of a joke. But seriously, like, how are they going to enforce that? Really, is yeah, the that's question. the thing. What? It's like, <laughs> like, 
Really? How are how are you, are you going to go check the dorms to make sure nobody's hooked up to whatever you know bookie online bookmaker they're they're using? I I don't get the. the it's I think it just feels moralistic. Like they're trying to impose. It's a moral thing, not like a logistical or whatever. It's just like oh, you shouldn't gamble. Like yeah, I mean, I don't gamble, but I don't want anybody telling me I can't. Like it's yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I just think it seems stupid. I don't know. What do you think, Andy? Yeah, yeah. There's just, I mean, there's not really a way to police it. So it's just saying something to, to kind of present y- yourself in a way that it's is like, signaling. hey, we're we're trying to we're trying to prevent this, even though there's no way for us to prevent this. So I, I don't really, I don't. Yeah, to me, it just seems like a, you know, I, I'm doing this because I have to, but I'm not actually going to do anything about it. Yeah, someone in the chat just said, I bet nobody under 21 there drinks either. Like, it's, I mean, <laughs> you're not going to, like, it's just, yeah, and IU is a dry campus. Like, it's, come on, just, people are going to do what they want to do. There you go. Uh, okay, this is from David. Given the recent news from KU, uh, if IU were to invite a hip-hop artist to perform at Hoosier Hysteria, who would you want to invite? He says, I asked this tongue-in-cheek, not believing we should actually do it. <laughs> Yo, this is Sneep Dio Double Dizzle. <laughs> Ryan, who would you choose? Our Tupac. listeners know that He's I will take alive. any excuse to play yeah. that drop. Tupac's Tupac. still alive, The Tupac right? hologram. He's that still would be alive, cool. right? It's, well, uh, I don't know. Some people I, think so. <laughs> like it's, I, let's invite Snoop and just embrace it. Why not? I don't know that many hip hop artists. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I, I can sense. Like, I know a lot of old hip hop artists, this is, but yeah, I, <laughs> I, I don't I was know like, a lot of the, of the ones guys. that I would have said are dead. So I, that, that felt like, yeah, could we get Curtis Blow to come do basketball? Because I think that would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> basketball yeah. Jones, maybe like those. <laughs> that's hip hop, right? Yeah. I think yeah. uh, that's old R and B, but we'll we'll let it slide. Okay, well. So there you go. You asked that question to us, and we don't have a lot of great answers. That was a, uh, that was a terrible answer. I, if I had yeah. to pick somebody more more recent, I would say uh, I'll go with Chance the Rapper, just to just to, Ooh, m- just to give sound. an actual like reasonable answer instead okay. of in saying that everyone we liked is uh, is deceased or. I mean, he's from the Midwest, right? He's from Chicago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll, we'll go with him. More about Chance the Rapper than I do. <laughs> All right. We'll go with him. <laughs> Uh, okay, this question from Jay is interesting. He says, last year, nine guys played at least 25% of the available minutes. Same thing in Archie's first season. Which nine guys will play at least 25% of the minutes this season? Well, now i got to open up the roster. It's- well, okay, so we can obviously, we, we know for I'm sure. I'm doing the same Rob, thing, which, Devontae, which speaks Al. well to our preparation. <laughs> yeah. no, so, no, but I mean, it's, it's for the down, the down the roster guys, I'm trying to think. Yeah, okay, Rob, Devontae, Al will. I think we can all agree that Justin Smith will. I think it's safe to say that Joey Brunk will. I think it's safe to say that Trace Jackson will. That's that's six right you got there. Got Duran in there, right? No, I don't yet. But okay. because what I want to say is he absolutely will if he's healthy. But he's yeah. a swing guy here, because yeah. you know you saw how important he was to the lineup last year and in Indiana's one loss record with and without him. I mean, I think he's got to play forty five to fifty five percent of the minutes for this team yeah. to really get where they want to go. Ideally, so I'd put I would him in there. Yeah. So that's seven. I mean, seven. And, I and then put, did you, Jerome you, you Hunter. You didn't say Jerome yet, right? Haven't, okay. haven't said Jerome, but I'm starting I, to feel more comfortable projecting yeah. him for for minutes. You know, the other guy that may be the most obvious candidate to get in there, I mean, you know, Race Thompson certainly you would say has a chance, but it's a crowded front court. You know, Armand Franklin may be able to slip his way in there because he's I would the fourth put, ball handler. Yeah. You know, I, 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 might, I, I might. I would think he may play out of necessity this year. That's not what even, I mean. No, yeah. Not, not even that he's one of the nine best, but it's just the the positional situation there. Um, I, I I think we're we're downgrading Ray Thompson as well. I think that it, it'll be interesting to see how he fits in. Uh, but I think Race could be a guy that jumps out and plays thirty minutes in a random game in the middle of the year and does really well. But I, I think he's going to be involved. I think Archie wants him involved, and so we'll see how it plays out during the year. But everything I've heard is that Archie really likes him and wants him to play. It's you're right. It's a crowded front court. So they'll have to be creative with how they use him. Did we forget anybody obvious? Demise is really the only other guy who yeah, would Demise. be in that discussion. Oh, that's right. We only I have 11 like. players this year. I forgot. Yeah. We've got two so that made scholarships. It, that made it easy. We perhaps <laughs> could have approached that in a different way, but nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we could. Yeah, I mean, okay. of the, yeah, it's really, at that point, if you assume reasonable health for, you know, Duran and, and Jerome, then you're really saying, I got to, you got to pick one of Armand, Demise, and, and Race. I would lean race um but i could see the argument for 
our mind just from a, a depth perspective positionally. I mean, knock on wood, you're one injury away from Armand Franklin having to play 25 minutes a game, 20 minutes a game, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah. so, well, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen, obviously. You know, nice for Jay to actually ask a good question. He's had a string of really poor questions that he's asked. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice to, <laughs> nice to see Jay him. Jay on blast on a Thursday night. <laughs> nice to see him actually ask a good one. Um, okay, uh, Josh says, as we are heading into the full swing of practice, who is your first gold jersey winner? I'm assuming he means... Like, who would you want to see win the first gold jersey? Does it matter? Like, would you want to see Devontae win it because he's a captain in the senior? Or are we predicting? Who's Maybe we're predicting. We were, take, it, take, it predicting. take it any way you want. Okay. Predict it. I'm saying Joey Bronk is going to win it. Mm, I, I'm actually going to go with Jerome Hunter. Because mm-hmm. if he's playing, he's going to be the most productive player out there, I think. So I'll, I'll say Devontae. But I also don't know how much they're limiting him in practice. It's true. Like in terms of time. So Devontae's I probably think the Brock is going to be the set the example for everybody guy and he's going to win one. Yeah. yeah, I just don't know how that I don't know how that I don't know how that translates to the gold jersey scenario. So Yeah, I don't either. We don't know the criteria. No, nor do any of us, but Yeah. We're guessing. Come on, we're allowed to guess. We are. I like Luke's question. Uh Luke's question. Yeah, this is a good one. So what is one thing you would go back and change in Indiana basketball history if you could go back and change just one thing? I think longtime listeners of this show will know pretty quickly which one Andy and I will pick. Go ahead. Alan Henderson's injury in 1993. Although, you know, Dennis in the community, you know, came over the top and kind of slam dunked everybody with the real correct answer, which is, you know, Landon Turner not getting injured. Yeah, that's, that's 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 if we all could actually do it, that's the one that everybody would pick. But if we're talking about like just on strictly court, basketball, yeah. yeah, in the game stuff, um, well, right, what would you pick? I've got yeah, that, one. yeah the Allen Henderson would definitely be one for me. Just to to see like to have watched your favorite team that really that you love more than any other team of that be able to like win a national championship because yeah. I think everybody believed they would would have been. Would have been pretty special. So. I got the most awful, gaping, emotional wound from my childhood. Yeah, a, I would. A close would second would be Ryan not uh, going back through last year's schedule, though. If uh, yeah. if we yeah. in, in the prior segment, if that would have been <laughs> yes. good. But uh, I've got. I think I've got a good one. Uh, Mike Conley and Greg Oden picking IU instead of Ohio State. Mm. That might have changed. Is... They took they took Ohio State to a national championship game as freshmen. Like, I think that's. That would have changed a lot of things at IU because IU actually had a decent had some decent guys coming back and that would have fit very well. So yeah. that's one that I can think of off the top of my head that would have been a program changer. I think. Yeah, that's a good one. Scott Mays broken arm in the chat came yeah. up and uh, not hiring Kelvin Sampson. What is another one that came up in the chat? Tom Coverdale yep. having a good ankle in two thousand two. Would like you know, to see that. Been- what would have been what would have been really funny about Kevin Sampson not getting hired? Do you know who else was on the list to be hired? John Beeline. No, nope. wasn't that when Beeline was on the list? He was, was that when we hired or was that when we hired Kareen? It would have been Kareen. I think uh, Kareen was the second choice. Uh, he had just had his whole Dwayne Wade thing and everything. He was very high. Oh, green. oh, it would have been Kareen then. Yeah, that's what oh. I'm saying. Is it, instead of like if Sampson hadn't been kind of forced on Greenspan, I think Greenspan would have hired Green. And then he that's just how you're a champion. That is. Um, okay, we've got about a minute and a half left. Uh, let's see. Which... Oh, let's get to Kent's question real quick. He says, as of now, IU has three players committed for the 2020 class. Of course, we all want Dawson Garcia to join the class. Yes, we do. Uh, but he will not decide until November. Do you want IU to add a point guard in the class of 2020? Uh, Diara Curbelo, I don't think, has in Indiana. I don't think he... I think he, he either announced the Final Five and Indiana wasn't in it, or he announced official visits and Indiana wasn't there. Uh, there's that Carter Witt guy, but I think everyone thinks he's going to stay out east. So really, it's Diara or nobody, it seems like. And he's, you know, a lot of people think Texas A&M is in there. Indiana's in there. Georgia's looked at him. Yeah, they could have to look for a transfer if they want to add a guard. Yeah, so, but do you want to see Indiana add a young point guard in 2020, even if it means that it makes the Christian Lander recruitment a little bit more difficult? But we do need depth behind Rob Finnessy, as we keep saying. What I do don't think? think I don't think it's going to affect the Christian Lander recruitment at all. Just like I think whoever committed to Indiana before Romeo Langford didn't have any effect on Romeo Langford because those are guys who are going to play no matter what. You know, it's not like they have to worry about the depth chart. I, I don't think. Um, yeah, like, don't reach for one. Don't reach yeah, for a four year yeah. guy. But if you can get a good, solid four star guy like Dr. Sure. Take him in a heartbeat. That's what I yeah, say. For sure. I, I agree. I think that, the, and I think the roster will work itself out. 
I'd Andy. almost say fantasy and I use like heavy pursuit of lander might impact somebody else wanting to sign more I would so agree. than the other way around. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that significantly. Yeah, it's a very good point. All righty, that is going to do it for us on this week's episode of The Assembly Call. If you want to see us do the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to Bob Thompson for producing most of the music that you hear on the show. And thank you for listening. We will talk to you again next Thursday night. Until then. Take it from me, Robert Johnson. Keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. All right. So some people were... Nice job, fellas. Some people in the chat were talking about it. Uh, I think it was Jay was saying the beeline was the choice. Um, I, beeline was certainly high on the list during the Samson pursuit. Um, I, I so he says that Beeline had an agreement in place to become coach. I I am not sure that that is been verified. I know some people have mentioned that. I was on campus during that. I was working at the IDS. We were researching all the candidates and everything. The guy who was right at the top of Greenspan's list personally was Tom Green. They knew each other, and and he was right there. I know that he was interested. He was very interested in Beeline as well. I don't think Beeline was leaving West Virginia at that point. That's just my personal belief. Um, but I do know what he's saying right now is actually true, is that, um, is that Herbert, the president, wanted Kelvin Sampson, and that's who end up being it end up, wound up being hired but um i don't know if this part's being true that they had to hire a minority i i don't believe that but uh greenspan i i don't know if that's true i mean uh i i know that uh herbert was the guy and he decided to pick calvin sampson uh beeline i know i they're, they're saying there's other people who are saying it, beeline was was had an agreement i i don't know that that's true um i know he was certainly involved um and i know that tom green was at near the top of the list as well so that's that i mean it's all rough night for jay first year calls out his questions when i calls him a liar <laughs> rough night <laughs> no he could he could be true it could, he could be right about the beeline thing i know uh I know some people who do not believe that is true, that he, they believe the beeline was certainly one of the guys and may even have taken the job, but that it was, it was not, uh, official or in any way, or like, you know, agreed to in any way, but that he was in the mix and that Crean was also on that list and in the mix. So Jay, you know just, who was, pulled out, Jay just pulled out the Trump card and said, Galen has talked about this at length. Yeah. I mean, I was there at the time too. And I, I heard a lot of the same stories that Galen heard. I mean, we're all we all we all have our sources in 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 the matter. Um, but yes, Beeline was certainly somebody that was talked to, I think. Um, but yeah, it uh, it was that was just such a weird hiring process because we were you know interviewing people, we were talking to people, um, all of that stuff, and we were hearing all these names and everything like that. And Kelvin Sampson didn't come up once, and then all of a sudden we got called in the newsroom. They're like, "Yeah, we got a tip." it's Kelvin Sampson. We we're all just like, what? Like, you know, cause you have, usually you have a list, you have a list of guys. And I think the reaction initially was pretty positive because Sampson had been so successful at Oklahoma. And, cause he's a good coach. He's well, and that's the thing ethically is ethically compromised, but he's a good well, coach. Well, the thing was that everybody at the time was saying the phone call thing wasn't that big a deal because it was a rule that had changed. And, he had kind of explained it away and everybody at Oklahoma felt like, yeah, it wasn't that big a deal. And he everybody needs to start doing that stuff after the rule changes. He's got this habit of doing it right before yes. the rule changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. And, and Get what, timing what, right. the thing about the phone calls, everybody's like, this is something that everybody does. They just got caught doing it. It's really not a big deal. It's not like he was paying players or whatever. The problem with Samson wound up being the academic side of things. I mean, that yeah. was the real problem. The phone calls, whatever, but it's, yeah, it's it was the 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 academic stuff was. I mean, that was stuff we heard in you know in Bloomington working for a newspaper in uh in Columbus like being around the program in Bloomington. We heard about that stuff like 
all the time that there was that kind of stuff going on that guys just won't even go to class or whatever. Like when you have those rumors going around town in your first two years as the head coach, that's bad. That's mm-hmm. really bad. And it was initial. So Billy Hollingsworth said Larry Bird staying at IU. That that's would be a big good one. one. That'd be a fun one. That would be Will Chamberlain coming to IU. That would have been interesting. Couldn't pay what Kansas was going to pay though. Some things haven't changed. <laughs> my, yeah, my <laughs> times have changed. Have not changed. Oh man! All right. Uh, so next week we'll do. Let's plan to do Justin Smith next Justin week. Smith. Yeah, yeah. Kansas there's Kansas. there's a lot to chew on there. With I mean, we got two years of data on him, and boy, he's 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 an X factor for this team for sure. Although one, like, I don't there, feel like he's path. gotten talked about as much in the off season. You know what I mean? Justin like Smith. everybody's focused a lot on. Devonte in the front court. Like well, remember the, last you know, year the, he the was the big topic. Whatever. Yeah, like Maybe he that's was for the best. Well, <laughs> like, remember last year it was like okay, breakout candidate. Yeah, yeah, Justin Smith. Like it was just yeah. like assumed because of yeah. how he finished the season, which maybe should give us a little caution with Devonte Green. You know, putting so much on how he finished the season, but I'm not. I'm not approaching that with caution. I'm full board president of the fan club, so I'm all about it. But. Justin will be interesting because there's a path to Indiana being successful that doesn't involve him being like a starter or a huge part of the rotation. But like, I think for Indiana to like really obviously to reach its ceiling, he needs to be one of the five best players. Can he be that? I don't know. Next week on the assembly call, (laughs) join us. Ryan has spider fingers now. I'm dealing with the chat. (laughs) Dealing Dealing with the chat mob. Yeah. Yes, you are. Um, well, hey, go deal with your ankle. Take care of that. I will. Yeah, it's time to ice and elevate again. Yes, it is. You need. You got to be fully healthy by February. Yeah. It's gonna, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're getting older, man. I'm 39. It might take till that long. Uh, that's what I'm saying. So we need you. We need you back in full health. Um. Oh, next week is going to be uh, Cameron's going to be on. Cam Drummond. So he'll Do be you joining need, us. Next is, week. is one of us going to be gone? Is Andy going to be off? Wow, that was that was hurtful. No, I was wondering, like, are we just doing three, or are we going to do four? That's... No, I guess we can try. Let's figure that out. Because um, if yeah, we can all, if we're all available, then we might move. Maybe we'll move his appearance to the next week. Um, we'll see. I I didn't know if one of you guys would need the week off. So if you don't, and you can all do it, then we can. I think he's available the next week too. Yeah, I'm okay. We'll probably need to uh, figure out um, Halloween being on a Thursday, just to give you a few weeks' notice. We may need to. Uh... Oh crap! Halloween's on a Thursday. Yeah. Oh geez, yeah, it's on thirty first this year. Really, I think, we, I think we should do it in costume. I think that'd be hilarious. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm just saying that Don't would know. be great. We'd also do it like if you guys have to do uh, trick or treating and stuff. We would record it later. Yeah, we could. We may need to. We may need yeah. to bump it. Well, bump later I'll have had five or six beers while I walked around with well, trick or treating, so that yeah. could get. And dressed up drunk, Andy. That'd be amazing. That what would be amazing. About? Okay, ratings that's, gold. That's what, that's what we want. Got to give the people what they want. That's right. Jay would like you to just sit there and be wrong in your wrongness, Ryan. <laughs> Todd Sony says he's been in costume every show. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. All right. Well, we'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Brent Brent Quinn has asked multiple times about this uh, Jeremiah April audio that you promised earlier. Oh, the uh, oh yeah, the April audio. So I, I would be remiss that. if I did not call that. Yeah, out. yeah. Okay, so let's listen to that real quick. That's a that's a good note to end on. So I played the like these two little clips, but here's here I'll play some of this conversation, and we can we can just stop it as we go if there's comments that we want to make. But again, Andy, you weren't here. This was the first game of the season. Indiana won by so, like 50 points. I'm so glad that I, I'm not tied to this. And It, and was, anyway, it was the debut of James Blackman Jr., Robert Johnson, Max Hotzel. So it was a lot of guys' first game. It was, I mean, Indiana just went off and killed them, obviously. But here's where we started talking about Jeremiah April Ryan. So if you want to, this will be like uh, Pod Save America where we can play OK yeah. Stop. And you can just say stop if you want to. Here you go. The rebounding was the most impressive thing for me. Listen to that voice. Well, when you got Max Hotzel in there grabbing nine of them. You know, Dude, that'll do what it. Are we using to record? Yeah, and that terror on the know. boards, uh, uh, Jeremiah, Jeremy April with two. Not Jeremiah. Okay. Jer- Stop 
let's just let's stop expecting kept calling him jeremy so i was making fun of you yeah that no they kept calling him on the broadcast they were calling him oh. jeremy april and so you That's were you were very frustrated by it this was a recurring theme throughout the show mm-hmm. okay. you mentioned it in your opening um anyways. i thought ryan was really establishing himself as anti jeremiah april earlier but basically <laughs> no. being so dismissive of him that he wasn't even going to say his april. correct name which no. would have been a good move really if you had distanced yourself from him early but it's nevertheless true. no he doesn't no ryan comes back around just wait <laughs> right so the Big Ten Network announcers tonight, they are mispronouncing, you know, Jeremiah April's name. Some I'm kind of, of I, I was wishing we had the student guys back there again because they did a much better job. Kudos they, to Some to things never changed. That again. still is, they that still holds true. much more prepared. I, I would say that. I also terrible. think that clearly the Big Ten Network guys did not think that Jeremiah April was going to even get in this game, which a lot of people didn't think he was going to play in this game. And clearly you know, when he game. got in, I tweeted Jeremiah April was real. Yeah, I, I mean, mean let, let's let's say this about Tom Crean. I mean, he has you know he has a history of recruiting big men that don't ever see the floor. And all we'd heard about with Jeremiah April is the infamous boot that, that he's that in still the boot. Out. You know, he'd done <laughs> some warm ups. But okay, let's talk about him real quick before we get into Zeisloft and a Here few of the other guys. Um, it's hard to take a lot from him getting in there for eight minutes of non-competitive basketball. So here are my two observations. Two. He looked more fluid than I thought simply because of his size and because of the injury. Oh, shit. You just said the he same thing. Pretty about, well out there. You know, Ryan said the same thing. And number about two, <laughs> that little yeah. turnaround jump right. shot he had. I mean, even if he's doing that against a chair, that's a nice little shot because he's tall enough that he can get that kind of shot off against a lot of guys. Now, would he have the confidence to do that at the Breslin center, you know, with two minutes left in a game down four points, we'll never know. Not, but we're not going to ask him to do that. We never but know. Just, we never got to see you know, the fact that he has that kind of skill and can flash it in his first time out on the, on the court at assembly hall. If we're looking for things to be encouraged about, I thought for his first time out on the floor, yeah. pretty solid. Now here comes One Ryan. Thing I love about April and this showed in his tape too, is he'll tape. catch the ball high and won't bring it down and will keep it high and turn around. And you saw it on that jumper. He kind of had the ball about his chest yeah. Instead of bringing it down to swing through or something, he kept it high and then shot it. And it's a little thing, and he's still got a long way to go. But you know still that kind of instinct is great for a guy who's six eleven. You know, and I, I will say this about Jeremiah April: he is every bit of six eleven. He is a big he dude, did. and he is a big dude. And it's nice to see some size on this roster, even if it's an inexperienced freshman who may not see the floor very much. At least there's some size somewhere, and. Uh, you know, so I, he's a we guy so who is a lot. I think like he's center. There we wasn't were. a whole lot of tape on him coming out of prep school, but I think that he's a guy who has a lot of potential if he can just sort of continue to develop. Yes, we actually we spent the first. To be fair, Ryan did not say over what period of time he would need no, to still I develop. Didn't. So indeterminate could Clearly still be happening right develop. now. We don't know. That's true. I will say I sp- I did my banner moment from that game on Hunter Perea. He was the big story coming out of that game. Wow! And it was eight minutes long <laughs> before you started talking. Eight <laughs> minutes. I don't know if that's because you wow. came late. I'm not quite sure, but it was. It had to be the longest intro that I've ever done. Good lord! If I ever do that, just start. Just cut me off if it goes that. I long. try to often. Jeez! Yeah, but eight um, minutes. Good grief! Uh, that little turnaround jump shot he had. <laughs> <laughs> what were we recording on? God, it sounds horrible. I think okay, so that was 2015, 2012. 20, I mean, that was our. That, I think that was YouTube because that was our. That was the fourth season. I think we'd started doing video by then. So I think that was straight when we were doing Google Hangouts on mm-hmm. air, straight to YouTube. Oh, I'm Google. pretty sure we were off. I'm pretty sure we were off Blog Talk Radio by then. Yeah, I think so too. But it was probably Google Hangouts. That makes sense. Uh, as Jay Horry said, uh, April was still playing college basketball last year. So he's still at, developing at Wheeling, at Wheeling, University. Wheeling University, dropping those turnaround jump shots. If only we'd had him at the Breslin Center against Michigan State, the prophecy mm. could have been fulfilled. Yeah, but yeah. alas, yeah, it was like a Game of Thrones prof- prophecy, <laughs> ridiculous and unfulfilled. Yeah, and, and poorly <laughs> written. It's so good. Dang. Huh. We should do that more, where we just play old audio and I make snarky comments over it. That would really that worked out well. <laughs> I'm gonna, so, I want to try and go back and find certain stuff, especially from the early days. It just amuses me to hear our ridiculous voices. But, uh, well, I will. If you have clips that you would like us to find, <laughs> email Jared at a That should call. be a weekly thing. Like, just you do like a 10 minute show where you hop on and just play an old clip and. 
Middle uh, of the day. We need to. We, we do at some point. We we do need to go back and relive the Kentucky show because that is the start. The first like you, you re-release that one another time, and I listen. Yeah. I listened to the whole thing again. It was <laughs> pretty, it was just as funny. It's Which so one? ridiculous. The Kentucky game when I hosted oh, yeah. the whole thing by myself. It was like incoherent for, for five I minutes. I called in on my way yeah. home from work. I'd been at work all day, and I hadn't really watched the game. It was, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, impressive. Yeah, what are you going to do? You missed it. You did miss a chance. Coach was calling for the uh, for his drop to be used during uh, the analysis of Jeremiah April, the one that you... <laughs> you <laughs> you <laughs> dumbass. <laughs> uh, I have a mad crush on Archie Miller. and yeah. All right. There, okay. There's other sports going on. I need That's, to exit, but good show, boys. What that are more important than talking about Jeremiah April? You should do a big lead story on that on the the legend of the turnaround jumper. <laughs> See how that goes with your new corporate. I'll pass overlay. because I'd probably get fired. <laughs> Jeremiah, Jer- what, who's what this if I Jeremy told you April guy? <laughs> what if I told you thirty for thirty? <laughs> uh, oh man. Okay, <clears throat> this has gone off the rails. Sorry to everybody still listening. Jay Ori, April had three points against Gannon last season. Well, there, well, there you there go. We go. Tied into this year. Turnaround jump shot and one, baby. <laughs> <laughs> he, I will say that is a guy who looked huge on the court. Like he looked enormous. I mean, I know he's. Did you ever see him in person? No, not in person. Right. I don't, not that I remember seeing him, but I don't think so. He did look was, big. He looks huge on the court. And usually, a lot of times, like a, a 6'11 guy won't look that like huge because it'll be next to other you know six eight six seven whatever but he looked enormous and i think it's because iu had so little size at that time that he just stood out area yeah. area man claims six eleven guy was big i mean he <laughs> looked big though this is the analysis people tune into the show for <laughs> Uh, There's a lot of things that everybody really wanted to back <laughs> off of from that original analysis of him, but I like that Ryan is doubling down. I'm, on, I'm leaning into you know it. it. <laughs> yeah. Leaning into it. Uh, that's all right. I got to go. All right. Well, all right, with y'all. that, <laughs> later, guys. <laughs> see you next week. All right. See you. <laughs> see you.